Hi, I'm here in YUL, Montreal, and behind me is the Swiss International Airlines Airbus A340-300, I believe, that will be taking us over to Zurich. Our day started in Toronto, and after a short flight to Montreal and a six-hour layover, it's off to Zurich on a Swiss Airbus A340-300. Our route has us departing north over Quebec and Newfoundland to cross the Northern Atlantic. Greeted by the sunrise over Ireland, we'll cross the channel and descend over mainland Europe, finally coming in for a landing at Switzerland's largest city. In total, we'll take seven and a half hours to cross at 3,720 miles. And when I say we, I don't mean the metaphysical you and I. I actually have a friend joining me today who I've known for a very, very, very long... What was your name again? Joking aside, this is Lauren, who made a terrible decision in choosing to travel with me, you know, given how annoying I am. Although, conversely, she did go on about her pants for a very long time. Um, they're vegan leather from Japan, and they're so comfortable. Like, the most comfortable pants, aside from sweatpants that I own, so I wear them a lot. I have them in three colors. Brown, light brown, and black. Yeah, they're great pants. You our plane today is a 17-year-old Airbus A340-300. A dying breed, these Quadjet A340s are a treat for any aviation enthusiast, even more so when you get to fly on one with a recently refurbished cabin. Now, I'm significantly dumbing this down, but essentially what they did was take the A320 engines and strap four of them to a slightly bloated A330, and our plane has the upgraded engines. On this trip, we had a six hour layover in Montreal, so while we're here, let me tell you a little bit about the place. The airport is named after Justin's dad, Mr. Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Located in the suburb of Dorville, it's not far from the city center, but weirdly, it's also not connected to Montreal's otherwise efficient and convenient metro system. Instead, Ubers, Lyfts, and taxis will get you into town or back in a reasonable 20 to 30 minutes, depending on traffic. Like the other major Canadian airports, this one is also split into a domestic, transporter, and international section. Having finished renovations a few years ago, the international concourse is spacious, modern, and very airy thanks to the curtain walls on either side. And also because of the glass, you get uninterrupted views of all the aprons. We had hoped that the Maple Leaf Lounge would be open by the time we took this flight, but unfortunately it was not. Like many other things here in Dorval Airport, it was still closed, in part because they are French and hence a little laissez-faire shall we say with opening hours, but mostly because of the coronavirus and the consequent lack of flights. However, if you ever get the chance to visit this lounge when it eventually reopens, don't pass up the opportunity. It is one of the best appointed and amenitized Air Canada lounges, for it too has recently undergone remodeling and now features lots of swanky seating, a staffed open bar that makes some great cocktails, live cooking stations, a buffet, and most importantly, really nice showers. But on this occasion, none of the lounges in the airport were open. In fact, despite a growing number of flights making a return to Montreal, the international section was still eerily quiet. So with five hours to kill, we went to one of the only restaurants that was still open to have some lunch. A couple of hours later, as the sun had begun to set, the boarding process began. Embarking the plane was done through class and zones, though this was pretty much a farce since there were only about four dozen passengers, no one in first class, and only eight of us combined in the two business cabins. So we're on the left, first door. Uh, quick okay, question, am I allowed to take photos on board, just not of people, just your cabin and stuff? Is that okay? That's okay, okay. just not with people. Okay, As beautiful. Alright, thank please. you so much. Okay, let me do that. You hold this. You're in there. Okay, do you want me to? Yep, yeah, it's still recording. Oh! I think I did something. It's like very close. 
That's fine. Okay. Do you want to go? No, no. I'll go sneak over to the other side of it. The main business cabin features 38 seats in a staggered 121 and 221 configuration. Every address has direct all access except for the odd numbered A seats. The forward mini cabin has the same layout, but with only two rows totaling nine seats. This hard product has recently been renovated, bringing them in line with what you can find on Swiss's 777s. And here's us for tonight, 5A and B. We'll look at the differences between the seats afterwards, but first let's do a comprehensive seat tour, and as always, we'll start with the touchscreen IFE. This one's fairly responsive and a decent size. Directly below this is a generously sized storage cubby. It does go quite deep, which comes in handy if you need somewhere to put your helmets. The foot space is good. Between the two seats you'll find the literature pockets, although it's not clear which one belongs to whom. Coat hook. And moving on to the console between the seats, you'll find a row of seat and lighting controls. Open this flat back here to reveal the Panasonic IFE remote, and in front of that you'll find the mattress and lumbar adjustments, as well as a massage function. On the divider between the two seats, you'll find an adjustable reading lamp, headphone port, and this hook thing, which is actually a really smart way of organizing larger items. Back here, there's a universal power outlet and a dimmable lamp. Now, I'm more impressed with this than I really should be, but there's a bottle holder, a simple but all too often overlooked convenience. Because the seat is relatively new, there's a shoulder strap out onto the seat belt, and the seat itself is upholstered in this comfortable fabric, which is always preferable to leather. Over on the aisle side, the armrest does go down to let you out during meal times and for some extra space when sleeping, although it is a little difficult. Here's the space between the two seats, and on the topic of space, there's a comfortable amount of leg and knee room. Finally, with the push of this button, the tray table comes out of the divider. It can then be adjusted laterally, and folds open for a large, yet still pretty sturdy, work surface. There are unfortunately no individual air vents, and as is the case with many European carriers, this flight did run pretty hot. Alright, later on in the week I was on this plane again in a single seat on the right side of the main cabin, so let's go have a quick look at that. These are staggered with the odd ones closer to the window and the even ones closer to the aisle. The former, which is the one I'm in, are also much more private. The suite itself is very similar, although you do get a little bit more legroom and space in general. Over on the console, everything is pretty much the exact same, except for this cabinet that comes out like this to provide a lot more storage. If you're in the middle seats, you also get a shoe cubby, but I didn't film that. I did, however, manage to film one of the coveted throne seats on my flight back. This one's a little lived in, but that's because it belongs to a viewer I bumped into who was nice enough to show me. This is him, his name is Eugene, and be careful, he's an accountant. Alright, going back to our initial flight, with a sub 20% load factor, boarding was done most expeditiously, although that's hardly a surprise, and apart from one other passenger in the seat in front of us, we had the mini cabin to ourselves. In case of impact on land or water, position yourself as shown on the screen. If you're wondering why there is a mini cabin at all, it's because this aircraft also has a first class cabin. I actually flew this product on the way home and you can check out that video when it comes out. The whole experience was essentially just an exercise in weight gain, which was very exciting. Back in Montreal, we pummeled down the runway and after using only about a third of it, reached our rotate speed. So hard to see. If you're like me and derive the bulk of your self-worth from your social media presence, then naturally the first thing to do once airborne is to connect to the Wi-Fi. Swiss offers quite a few packages, all of which are incredibly expensive. Like 65 US dollars for one fifth of a gig, like what the, what the fuck? That's a bigger ripoff than Bella Thorne's OnlyFans account. I bought it anyways. Although I did feel really dirty so I went to wash my hands immediately afterwards.
And while we're back here, let me show you the bathroom. This is the standard Airbus affair, which means a lot of usable counter space, unlike its Boeing counterpart. Uh, you get a toilet. That works. And over here is a full-length mirror to look at yourself in, and the spare. Overall, the bathroom was kept pretty clean throughout the flight, which is all you can really ask for. When I got back to my seat, the dinner service was just beginning. The festivities commenced with an amuse-bouche, nothing too special, just a couple of savory bites. Before the rest of the meal gets here, let me quickly show you the menu, which is impressively still provided in its physical form. Like many other airlines, Swiss offers a local culinary experience showcasing dishes and ingredients from a rotating roster of cantons. This is, however, only available on flights departing from Switzerland, and since Montreal is, in fact, not in Switzerland, which has got a regular menu, as well as a breakfast card to be filled out and handed to the crew. Pardon the change of scenery, I had to refilm this because the lighting was atrocious on the plane at this point, uh, but there is a reasonably sized wine list, along with a cocktail menu, and impressively, espresso drinks as well. I went for the Swiss white wine and a very hoppy and delicious Swiss specialty beer. And the meal itself came all together on one tray, no fuffing around with the individual courses nonsense, this is an overnight flight after all, so the expedited service format was a welcome. Chicken can sometimes be an ambitious choice when it comes to airplane food, but this dish that came as a recommendation over the fish did not disappoint. It was beautifully cooked to perfection, juicy, light, and full of flavor. Meanwhile, my neighbor went for the beef, but honestly, neither of us really remember how it tasted, so let's just say that it was forgettable. Both dishes were accompanied by a light salad and a small cheese platter. Dessert was a vanilla and raspberry cake. It was pretty good. I mean, it's hard for dessert not to be good. Yeah, it was, it was pretty good. Moreover, they had port, which comes from Porto in Portugal, hence the name. Uh, but I'm pretty sure you knew that already. Anyways, port in the air is the ultimate indulgence, at least for me, and a pretty good nightcap at that. By the time the meal service was over, we were well on our way across the Atlantic tracks. The cabin lights were dimmed, and it was time for some shut-eye. Having done our homework, we found out that the left side seats actually offer the most room, so I stole Lauren's seat and exiled her across the aisle. In the fully flat position, the A seats are actually really roomy. The mattress is thick and comfortable, privacy is no concern, legroom is not an issue, and I could very comfortably sleep on my side. With that said, apart from the pillow and blanket, no other bedding was provided. But the blanket was thick, it was late, and always grateful for a lie flat seat, we had no troubles falling asleep. I went for a little walk after waking up, and by the time I crawled back into my seat, we were approaching Ireland. Since the sun was up, and thus the lighting much improved, let me show you the amenity kit, and props to Swiss who continue to provide these throughout the last couple of months despite many other airlines discontinuing theirs. This year's kit is made by Victorinox and comes in a sleek black metal case. The contents were a little spartan, but the essentials are all here. Earplugs, toothbrush, 
eye shade, a full-size lip balm, which is always a welcome on airplanes, toothpaste, and of course a pair of bombastically red socks. The shell itself also makes a pretty good pencil case. Moving on, let's check out the entertainment system and the provided noise-canceling headphones. These came sealed in a clear plastic bag, and they look like the fairly standard over-the-year variety of headphones. Now, this might just be me with my abnormally microcephalic head, but these headphones were fabulously uncomfortable. The ear cups were an awkward size, meaning I couldn't really get them to stay on my ears, and the headband was way too tight. Anyways, moving on to the software, the user interface presents itself in a series of boxes that you poke with your finger. And while the UI was intuitive enough, the content was where Swiss fell behind. Apart from a sprinkling of new releases, there wasn't much else in terms of films. The selection wasn't austere, but I can imagine beyond one or two flights, most people will exhaust the roster of films that interest them. TV shows were sadly the same, an average amount of programs, but not very many episodes in each. Overall, the breadth of content available pales in comparison to those on North American carriers, and falls short of the likes of Lothanza or BA. Happily, the system still features Airshow 3D for its moving map, with its full suite of functionality. I was silently hoping for an outboard camera, but I can't say I was disappointed when there wasn't one, though a tail view of an A340 would have been a real treat. The remote control has all the standard browse functionality, allowing you to control the media from the handset. However, it can't play videos on itself, although I'm not sure what kind of person would want to. It does however allow you to run the route map, so you can always have that handy. At this point, the cabin crew noticed that we were awake, and promptly brought us breakfast. The meal was quite simple, but I think that is the idea, a fast but adequate breakfast to get you going, allowing for more time to sleep. The croissants were warm by the way, and there's cheese if you wanted it. But if you are someone who wants a more substantial start to your morning, don't fret because business passengers do have access to the arrivals lounge in Zurich where they feature a hot buffet. Mind you, it was closed during our time there, but honestly, as long as I get decent coffee in the morning, I'm a happy camper. Now, before you call me out for being unchivalrous, I did offer Lauren her seat back for landing, but she said she was fine where she was. That's good news for you, because the approach was categorically stunning. So, to sum things up, we chose to fly Swiss over to Europe for a few reasons. One, their flights were hardly full, so there's tons of room for social distancing. Now I know that sounds really pretentious when you're flying business class, but hey, it's true. Secondly, Swiss is offering pretty much their regular onboard service, minus the hot towels, whereas most other airlines have drastically reduced their offerings. And lastly, because we've heard good things about Swiss, and they absolutely did not disappoint. For example, the crew, of which there were a lot of because of how many door positions this plane has, were superb. Friendly and proactive, they really shined when Lauren was feeling a little unwell and they did everything they could to make her feel better. And no, she didn't have the coronavirus. To conclude, I'll chance a comparison. If you've ever flown Lufthansa in business, well, Swiss is just like them. But just a little bit better in each and every way. Our guests on board, and we're looking forward to welcoming you again soon. On behalf of Swiss and your crew, thank you very much for flying with us. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Everything was really aesthetically pleasing, which was nice. Um, there were a lot of staff, which we agreed on. And, well, I was like super hungover on this flight. Yes. And the staff were very persistent about bringing us wine. 
which was really nice. But where are the bathrooms? Nice. Okay. Yeah. What is what is Austria famous for? Um. Starting world wars. I'm trying to think of like a food they're famous for, so I can say on a more positive note. They also gave the world Hitler, who made the gas chambers. 